All right, so afternoon, folks. I'm super excited to be here today. Uh, I'm Yoss, and I'm here to share with you getting started with smart contracts. So um, a little about me, I'm Yoss. I graduated from NUS, and since then, I've worked at several companies. Currently, I'm heavily involved in smart contracts and decentralized applications, and I'm currently working at 10x. So uh, this is a topic I'm super passionate about, and I'm, again, I'm really excited to share this with you. And I've written a lot of, uh, of articles around uh, this space. Um, if you're interested to learn more beyond this talk, you can check out my blog at yours.io. So I've also started a meetup group, uh, for, uh, which is a community to where you can gather and discuss the topics that we're going to talk about today. Uh, it's called Web3 Singapore. Uh, if you find the topic that I'm going to share with you today interesting, and would like to learn more, do check out this meetup group. It's called Web3 Singapore. Um, yep. So this is what we're going to talk about uh, this afternoon. Uh, we're going to start with an introduction to the idea of decentralization and why that matters. Um, we're going to learn about Solidity, the programming language of choice when you're building smart contracts. And we get there will be a hands-on component, um, at which point you should, if you want to follow along, you can. Um, just make sure you have your laptop open. And finally, we're going to look at some current and emerging use cases. What can you do with smart contracts? And what have people done with smart contracts? So, so this is our agenda for today. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to have a quick poll. Um, raise your hands if you are uh, working as a software engineer. OK, all right. So raise your hands if you are a student. All right, all right, great. All right, so I'm going to start with a story. All right. So modern software is built on APIs. So what are APIs? APIs are third-party services and um, software, basically. Things like the Twitter API or the Facebook API. So these are services that let you consume other people's code by making network calls via the internet. All right. So here's an example of an API. This is the Twitter API. So what can you do with the Twitter API? Well, you can do things like search tweets, basically access the content and users on the Twitter platform. Right. So let's imagine you're a developer. You want to build the next big thing. Right. And let's say you want to build something for Twitter users. And so you have to use the Twitter API. Right. So you ask Twitter for permission. Hey, can I build on Twitter? And let's say Twitter says, yes, here's an API key. And that key gives you access to the Twitter API. And let's say that you've built this app, um, a Twitter client, an unofficial Twitter client built on top of the Twitter API. And your users love it, right? User growth is going steady. Um, investors are calling in. Everything is smooth sailing. Now what happens when Twitter says no? Actually. I want you to stop using our API. So this has happened before. So APIs are prone to ecosystem collapse. So the problem with platforms is they can change their terms of service at any time, and they can revoke the permission that they've given you at any time. And a lot of startups and apps have been killed because of uh, changes like this. So for example, in this case, um, a Twitter client called Leaf um, joins others as basically as it gets killed by Twitter. So this is a quote from a VC. Uh, it says, I lived through the Twitter ecosystem collapse, and now I'm a VC. I worry about investing in startups that are built on any large ecosystem where there isn't an alignment of clear economic interests. So in the beginning of its life cycle, a, a large platform like Twitter could be as welcoming as possible. Right? It would welcome all the developers to build on top of its platform. But as it gets traction, as it gets more users, it, it gains incumbency. So basically, it reaches a point where it can stop being nice and start extracting value. So this is a, this is a problem with using centralized platforms. Um, because these APIs are proprietary and permission. Once they get traction, all the power is on them, basically. Can't do anything about, it, about that. So, I'm going to tell you another story that illustrates the difference between permission and permissionless. So how many of you have heard of uh, Wikipedia? Obviously, everybody's heard of it. Um, but how many of you have heard of Encarta? Some of you as well, OK. But how many of you use Encarta now? <laughs> exactly. Right. 
so all of us still use Wikipedia, I'm gonna assume. So there was rivalry between these two products, encyclopedia products back in the early 2000s, right? In early like 2005, um, Encarta was, um, was really popular and it beat Wikipedia on all aspects, the quality of coverage, breadth of topics, editing, number of um, articles and so on. Basically it was the top um, encyclopedia product. Wikipedia was just starting out back then. So, but over time, Wikipedia was, uh, grew its community of um, volunteers. Um, number of topics on its pages increased over time. And because it was permissionless, new and new volunteers could enter and contribute. Uh, in comparison, Encarta was a closed group, right? It was a, uh, a group of company researchers and editors um, specific to the, the Encarta product. So in 2009, uh, Encarta closed its doors and Wikipedia continues to exist today and has become much better than Encarta ever was. So we now live in a time of dominant large platforms, right? But this wasn't always the case. Um, back then, it was a very different time, right? We have forgotten the old ways of building internet services. Uh, back then, people used protocols rather than platforms. So one example is email. So email is built on something called the SMTP. It's a protocol, meaning it's a, an open set of instructions or rules that govern how email programs communicate with each other, right? So these rules are open source. Anybody can innovate on top of it without having to worry that, you know, somebody's gonna change the rules later on. So because of that, people were free to innovate. So compared to the problem of Twitter spam, for example, Twitter spam exists still, but email spam is pretty much a solved problem most of the, I mean, most of the time. Um, that's because everybody could work on the problem of email spam, but only Twitter could work on the problem of Twitter spam. So it gives a more open um, a playing field for people seeking to solve problems. So, so this is the difference. Uh, platforms are centralized, but protocols are decentralized and open, so anybody could work on them. But the reason why protocols didn't catch on was because, number one, probably the most major problem is it had no business model, right? Anybody can just use, uh, read somebody's protocol and use it to build a platform. And there was no way to enforce like some monetization transfer between the platform and the creators of the protocol. So there was no incentive to create a protocol. And it was limited to hobbyists, researchers, who, and volunteers who do it for, just for the sake of it. But the recent crypto, um, the rising crypto ecosystem have made this now possible. So instead of going through a platform like a Twitter API or something, um, people can just transact with each other using trustless smart contracts on the blockchain. And the business model can be, in, can be solved through incentivized currencies known as cryptocurrencies or tokens, however you wanna call it. So this is what we're gonna learn today. Um, one way I would try to explain what e the Ethereum blockchain is, is it's a serverless platform. It's a place where you can upload and run smart contracts, which are open source, and sprinkle on top a bit of internet money. So in other words, it's a printing press for protocols that have built-in incentives. So how many of you have heard of uh, Netscape? Netscape, right. So, um, so Mark Anderson, one of the founders of Netscape, and um, I guess people know him as, know him, he's now a VC at Anderson Horowitz, and in one of the, his interviews, he, he mentioned the original sin of the internet. I'm gonna ask you this question. What do you think is the original sin of the internet? What's missing from the original internet? Exactly, money. So, what, so Mark Anderson said that he couldn't include payments in the early internet. And that led to basically the advertising hell that we live in now, right? because there was no other way to monetize. If we had built in payments back then, perhaps you know, platforms could just include payments and just skip on the ads. So 
But with crypto, we now have that. A, a web native way, uh, a web native um, a way to pay between parties. Right. All right, so what are smart contracts? I'm gonna keep this as a very, at a very high level. We don't have much time. Um, smart contracts are basically just a program stored on a blockchain. And what's a blockchain? A blockchain is basically a spreadsheet or a table, right? So you can imagine that um, you know, a spreadsheet has many cells and many rows. Um, a contract can be deployed similar to how you deploy software on AWS or Google Cloud. You can deploy contracts on a blockchain. And you can imagine that once you deploy, a contract could live in a single cell in this big spreadsheet, right? And each contract has an address. That's it, that's all you need to know for now. This is an example of a smart contract. So this is written in the Solidity programming language on, uh, for the Ethereum blockchain. So if you've written a pro software in other languages like JavaScript, Python, or Java, this might look familiar. Uh, we're, we're gonna go through it very slowly and so that you know how to read this. All right. So Solidity is a high-level language for smart contracts. Internally, um, Ethereum runs on a virtual machine, but you don't need to worry about that. You can write smart contracts using a very high-level language, familiar to you if you've written in other languages like Python or Java. It's uh, Turing complete, which means that you can basically build whatever, whatever it is you can imagine, right? So it's very flexible and very programmable. Again, this is what it looks like. Let's take a closer look at um, each component. So, First is the, uh, so the, I'm just going through the syntax of the language now. So first is the contract, uh, the contract. It's a container that includes data and functions. You can think of this as a class in uh, object-oriented <laughs> languages. It's just a, a container that can contain some variables and some functions. So in this sample code, I have a contract called my token with some data and methods, right, potentially. Then it has Solidity as variables, right? And in this contract, my token, I have a name, which is a string, and this is the, ver is the data assigned to this variable name. So this is a Boolean uh, called total supply, and it's a thousand. Things pretty clear so far. So you notice that Solidity has types, so it's statically typed, like Java or other statically typed languages. As things like booleans, integers, unsigned integers, string, also has addresses. So addresses are a unique type. And you can think of an address as an, a unique ID on the blockchain, like your email address, that kind of thing. And it also has a hash table or dictionary uh, called a mapping, where, for example, it could be a mapping from a string with a key and a boolean as a value. So, Next is functions. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So functions, this is a function called hello. It has no parameters, and it returns a Boolean. And then this is the function body, just returns true. Constructors is a special kind of function. Um, like constructors in object-oriented classes, it's a function that takes in some parameters and is used often to initialize state in the contract. So in this contract, in this constructor, this contract accepts an address um, labeled minter, and the body could maybe save this or do something with this address. And finally, assertions. So assertions are uh, uh, used to validate inputs, so you specify a Boolean statement. So this returns true or false, and you wrap it in a require block. And this will, depending on whether or not this evaluates to true or false, the transaction or the function call will fail or continue. All right, so that's the very basics of what you need to know to start writing smart contracts. So if you'd like to follow along, uh, I'd like you to go to this link um, on your machines. Just, I'll give you a few minutes to um, get set up. So the URL is remix.ethereum.org.
All right, so this, uh, this is Remix. So this is basically like a JS Fiddle. It's an online code editor for smart contracts. I'm gonna write a very quick, uh, very simple currency, basically, in a, in, a, in a few lines of code. So when you, we think of a currency, what do we need to implement? Well, I think we need at least two things. First, a way to view the balances of each address. So for example, I wanna know how much of my tokens you have, right? And the other is the ability to transfer tokens. So for example, let's say I wanna pay you some, some of my tokens, I can just send it to you and you can receive it. So that's the minimum viable um, currency. And for testing purposes, we're also just gonna create a, a function that creates a currency. All right, so here's this contract. So this first line of uh, code is um, referring to the version of the Solidity compiler. You can think of it as the version of the language. So it's a uh, continually evolving language. New versions release things like uh, uh, security improvements, uh, more type checking, and so on. So here we specify that we are using the 0.5.11 version of Solidity. So, and now we define a new contract called simple token. So let's start by defining a variable. Um, I'm gonna start defining, ah, sorry. Okay, let me just start over. So once you get this page, you go to file. There's a link called new file. I know the UI is absolutely <coughs> terrible. So this is a new file. Click new file. So dot so sol is the um, file extension for Solidity smart contracts. Create a new file. Then let's start writing Solidity. Do we need D? All ah, right, you can just ignore it and create a new one. Yeah, or you can yeah you can delete it as well. Right, I'm gonna start with specifying the first uh, version, uh, the version of the contract, version of the uh, Solidity compiler. Then we create a new contract. And let's start with creating some variables. So you can name this, this, this will be the name of our cryptocurrency, so you're free to use whatever you want. I'm just gonna call mine uh, Geekcoin. So um, you will notice that I'm gonna use some keywords here, public and constant. You don't have to worry about this for now, all right? You can just follow, just follow along. And when you think of cryptocurrencies, they usually also have a ticker symbol, so things like, uh, uh, BTC or ETH, right? So you can also specify your own here. I'm just gonna call it Geek. Then I'm gonna define something else. So this is um, decimals. This is actually part of a token standard. So when you think of a cryptocurrency such as uh, ETH, I oh know. Uh, most of the cryptocurrencies you see on exchanges are something called ERC20 tokens. So these tokens follow a particular interface or standard, and we're basically implementing our token to follow that standard. So uh, for, for the purposes of this workshop, you can just um, type this in. All right, so next, what do we need? Let's create our balance function. So want to create a balance function. Let's call it balance off, and it should accept um, an address as a parameter. I'm gonna call it, uh, what did I call it? Let me check, account. And it returns an unsigned integer. So basically what this balance function does is it accepts an address and returns the amount of tokens that address has. 
And so to store these tokens, we need a dictionary or a hash table. It's called a mapping in Solidity, where the mapping is has address as a key and unsend integer as the value. And let's call it balances. And in our function, it's very straightforward. We return the balances of the account. All right, so this implements the first part of our currency already in just a few lines of code. So with this, we can know how much tokens each address has. So next, let's create um, a minting function. So this would um, help us it's very helpful for testing, but this is usually currencies also have some way to create new tokens. Right, so how do we create new tokens? That sounds really hard. Like how do we create new tokens? It's actually very simple. Um, what you have to do is just increase the balance of the address you want to give tokens to. That's, that's it. All right, next, we'll implement the transfer function. So this would allow us to basically perform uh, payments to other addresses. And it's also very simple. Uh, first, you just have to deduct. Um, so message to sender is a built-in variable. So this would be uh, the address of whoever's calling the function or the calling the smart contract. So for example, when I call a smart contract, I call this transfer function the message to sender will be my address. So first we need to deduct um, the tokens from my address and then add that amount to the destination. So this is pretty much it. Very, very simple. So now what we can one of the uh, challenges with smart contracts is once you deploy your smart contract, you cannot change it. It's immutable. So how on earth do you fix a bug? So this is a problem, right? So at the very least, we should make sure that our functions are secure or at least behave as intended. And one of the best ways to do that is to use require statements. So for example, uh, in my transfer function, perhaps, I want to make sure that um, the amount is more than zero, right? Just to avoid some, I don't know, unnecessary transactions. Right? So if the amount supplied to this transfer function is zero, then this would not execute at all, basically. And yep, so this is the minimum viable contract. So now, what you can do is um, deploy this on a, a test net. So you can think of this as staging uh, a test environment for Ethereum smart contracts. And before I continue, any questions at this point? So the balances, so this, um, this dictionary would uh, when the contract is first instantiated, all the values will default to zero. So, for example, in this, in this, in this case, everybody's balance will be zero, basically. Yeah. Yes? Sorry? Um, so, a constructor is optional, right? So, if you don't have any 
you don't have any need to initialize any state in the beginning, then you don't have to create a constructor. But let's create a constructor. So let's say that, so this minting function, for example, allows any address, currently allows any address to mint any tokens to anybody, right? So if you're creating a currency, would you use a currency that whose supply can change at any time? Probably not, right? So perhaps you want to make sure that these, this function, only certain parties can create uh, new tokens. So what we can do is first um, create uh, what you call a super user of some kind. And sorry. So this will be the only address that is allowed to mint new tokens. So how do we do that? Well, we can use the require, uh, require statement and check that the only person who can call this function is the minter address. And we can create, we can set that minter address with a constructor. So when we, when we once we deploy this contract, this constructor will execute. Uh, when we deploy, we have to pass in a, an address, ideally probably you know, your address. And it will be assigned as the minter address. And that address will be the only one who can, ex can create new tokens because of this check. All right. All right, so th the next step, so this is, in a few lines of code, we've just created a currency. So what can we do next? Well, we can deploy this on the Ethereum blockchain. Now, to actually deploy this, it involves a few setup um, steps. Um, you'll need to uh, set up something called MetaMask. Um, this is out of scope. I think to save time, I'm gonna skip a few, a few steps. Uh, but I'm gonna just show you how to deploy a contract. So. So if you use Remix, um, there's a plugin system. You'll have to activate the deploy and run transactions module. Um, you, you can just watch me do it now. So with this interface, you can deploy contracts. So for example, in this case, I'm gonna deploy Let me refresh. Ah, right, right. <laughs> Sorry. So I basically, uh, so MetaMask is a browser wallet. So a wallet is just a piece of software that manages your address and private keys on Ethereum. Um, I'm gonna sub create, uh, I'm gonna deploy this contract with my address. So, so this, oops. So what this does is it, it's gonna make a transaction. Again, I'm not gonna go through it today. It's very complex. Um, but basically, I'm gonna upload my smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain. And in order to do anything on Ethereum, you have to pay gas. So essentially this is payment for computational power, right? So um, the Ethereum blockchain is maintained by a network of miners, basically people who run the Ethereum program in order to keep everything up and running, right? So we've just approved a request. And so Etherscan is a blockchain explorer. You can think of it as a browser for blockchain um, actions. And once you deploy, it's basically gonna get mine. Um, oh, I think it was confirmed already. Right, so, uh, so this is basically displaying the status of the transaction. It was the deployment of the, our contract was successful. And this is the, um, Basically, this, this, the, uh, this is the address of our contract. And if you have a mobile wallet, you can um, add your tokens by just supplying the address. 
and we will have it here. So I've already had, I've already done it uh, once before with a previous, uh, another version. And at this point, you can see, for example, I have 2019 geek tokens. And I'll be able to send any, these tokens to any address, right? So this is a very, this is a minimum viable cryptocurrency um, that we've just built in, what, 10, 15 minutes? Yep. So that was Remix. Uh, obviously, in, to make uh, actual in production, you shouldn't use something like this. Um, there's proper tooling involved, but I thought this is probably one of the easiest way to get started. So, so in the span of, uh, what, a few minutes, you created a cryptocurrency from scratch, and specifically, you, can, you just created an open source, transparent, bankless, pro programmable money with a few lines of code. And the key part is this programmable point. So as I mentioned, Solidity is Turing complete, meaning you can build whatever it is that you can imagine. So for example, let's say you want to make sure that uh, you want to introduce new ways of new rules around how tokens are minted, you want to introduce how tokens can be used, and so on. You can do that um, with just additional lines of code. So here are some characteristics of smart contracts. Um, one very, very strange characteristic is that it's immutable. right? So as a software developer, we're used to things like um, move things, uh, what, uh, move fast and break things and iterate constantly, right? If you wanna ship something, start small, and then just keep pushing, just keep pushing. You know, new commits, deploy multiple times, several times a day. Well, with smart contracts, uh, once you deploy a contract to an address, that's it. The code is mostly fixed, right? So this has several interesting properties. One is, once, if you are consuming a contract on the blockchain, then you can, be, you can be reasonably confident that once it's there, it's gonna be there forever and you can continue depending on it. So if you compare it with the Tutor API, for example, um, if you are, instead of, let's say instead of consuming a Tutor API, you're consuming a smart contract, then that can never be taken down. Nobody can ac actually stop you from talking to that smart contract. So that gives some level of certainty, but at the same time, it makes upgrading contracts very difficult. Now, there are ways to do it, but it's not easy. So the second part is it's open source. So by default, all smart contracts are open source. So Twitter is proprietary, but let's say there's a, an open source version of Twitter, right? If Twitter abuses their incumbency in some way, let's say you know, they've reached a large user base and start charging excessive fees, then technically anybody can fork that open source code and run it run another instance, except with less fees, and make users happy still. And finally, it's permissionless and composable. Again, once it's deployed, it can never be taken down. So anybody can innovate on top of these smart contracts without having to worry about things like you know, lose, losing your API key, you know, having your permission revoked, or um, Yeah, so you don't have to worry about those things. Um, you don't have to ask for permission and you can innovate without worrying about things like terms of service changing and so on. So smart contracts are permissionless. You don't have to ask somebody or anybody like Twitter or some other platform to innovate and build and consume these programs. And what has this given us, right? So um, how many of you are familiar with the term decentralized finance? Not many of you, all right. This is a very, pretty new um, development in the space, maybe in the past one year. And it's basically an explosion of innovation in the uh, smart contract space where people are building composable services around providing financial services. So what do I mean by that? For example, you can build lending services, P2P lending services using smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. You can build decentralized exchanges that allow you to trade tokens without trusting a centralized party. You can build other uh, uh, more advanced financial products like derivatives, margin trading. So these are very, very, very um, comp slightly difficult to understand products, but it has been implemented on the Ethereum blockchain. And the most interesting part of this is that there are a lot of parallels between the developments in this space and the early days of the internet. So on the left here is the, uh, a diagram 
showing the growth of the ARPANET. So this, this is the precursor of the, the internet we know today. And on the right is a diagram on the, how different smart contracts or protocols on Ethereum communicate with each other. So everybody is building on top of each other and they don't have to ask permission for permission and they can just innovate and grow organically. All right, so we've just had a brief uh, an overview of Solidity smart contract. Um, we've written out a very, a very, very simple um, cryptocurrency with Solidity. And next I'm gonna go through a more um, wide view of where things are going given the tools that we have. So you might be wondering at this point, all right, so we've created a simple a smart contract. What can I build? Here are some ideas. So how, how many of you have heard of CryptoKitties? Right, so CryptoKitties are basically a digital, a crypto collectible, right? It's a digital asset tracked with smart contracts on the blockchain. So the idea is when we think of a digital piece of art, let's say digital artwork, like a picture or uh, like a, somebody's art piece on divine art or some other um, image sharing site, it's very easy to copy, right? So scarcity doesn't make sense in a digital world because you can just copy and clone and there's no way to verify whether it's the original or whether it's the only one, right? So by blockchains and smart contracts allow you to track um, something like a digital artwork. So for example, what, um, what you can build is for example, a, a digital art marketplace, which is provably scarce. So let's say you're an, you're an artist and you wanna sell a digital artwork. Well, you can issue these artworks as tokens. And let's say you, could, you generate five tokens for a particular artwork. And then you can provably claim that these, there are only five limited editions of this artwork and I'm selling them. How much would you pay for it? Right. Now, I'm, here's a poll. Would you pay for a limited edition digital artwork? Okay, well, it's, this is, I expected that answer. <laughs> <laughs> so with the, my point is, this is it's still in the experimental stages, right? Um, so sometimes we don't pay for things because of the utility of that something. We might pay it for, to appreciate the artist or as a signaling mechanism somehow, things like that. So yes, it doesn't make economic sense to be honest, but perhaps there are other use cases around that. So here's another uh, use case that I'm super passionate about. So let's think about say traditional art auctions, right? Imagine um, a painter created this piece of, uh, piece of art, physical art, and it gets sold in an auction for 100 million, right? How much of that goes to the artist? If the previous owner was not the artist, probably zero, right? So, but what we can do with smart contracts is if, let's say we tokenize a piece of art and there's a buy or sell function to uh, buy or sell these um, tokenized art, what we could do is, like in the same way that we have a minter address in the example, we could have an artist address in which, to which a percentage of, purchase, of the purchase price could go to. And what that would create is a sustainable funding model for the artist, right? Every secondary sale is income for the artist. So these are new monetization models that are possible with smart contracts that were not possible before. So, and we hear this a lot these days. I think um, we could also even tokenize real assets. So instead of digitally native goods, we could convert real world assets like um, you know, real estate, um, stocks, commodities into tokens and get access to all kinds of services on the blockchain. So, but this is still a very, very um, early, at its very early stages. So the next thing that's even more exciting than the previous use case is decentralized finance. So this is an incredibly new development. It's, um, the way I would put it is it, it tries, it's the internet of money, right? So let's say we're in Singapore. We have a very developed uh, financial market 
if you want to buy stocks, you can. You can just sign up to a CDP account, you know, go through the KYC or wherever, sign up for a bank account. But what if you live in somewhere like Zimbabwe or Uganda or some other country where the rule of law perhaps is not as strong, um, the currency might be volatile, and you don't have just as equal access to financial markets and financial services like lending and borrowing. How do you, how do you get this stuff? You can't. So with decentralized finance, because it happens over the internet, you can access and give financial services to anybody, regardless of physical location or jurisdiction. Right. So what are some examples? So this space has been growing quite rapidly, actually. Um, so this is, um, you can think of it as the, the market size of the DeFi ecosystem. So it's about half a billion. And it's growing steadily. So what services are possible on the blockchain? So here are some things that have actually been built, right? I'm not just talking about theory, these have been built. So stable coins, for example, is one use case. Most currencies are volatile. You wouldn't want to spend um, a currency that will, might rise 10 times tomorrow, right? So stable coins are, are uh, a currency that follows a set of rules that make its value stable. Usually it's pegged to some fiat currency like US dollars or Hong Kong dollars, where one of the stable coins could be redeemed for, or is equal in value to uh, one US dollars, for example. So, so these stable coins are just smart contracts. And these stable coins can then be used by other smart contracts, such as you know, decentralized exchanges, uh, lending and borrowing, margin trading derivatives, and so on. So you can earn, so for the folks who are in developing countries or countries without financial markets, they would be able to access things like lending, borrowing, they can earn interest on their savings, and have a stable uh, currency that they can use to preserve their savings. So here's, a, here's an example of a typical um, lending service on, smart uh, on a smart contract uh, platform. So this is a Dharma. So basically, here you can borrow either the ETH currency or DAI, and you get some interest rate. And these interest rates are calculated dynamically based on the demand and supply of uh, lenders and borrowers in the actual smart contracts. And you have terms, borrow limits, and so on. And the repayment of the interest is enforced by smart contracts. You don't have to trust like a bank. You don't have to trust some issuer or regulator somewhere. You can do this just directly with uh, the smart contracts. And because of the permissionless nature of smart contracts, once you have a protocol like a stable coin or an exchange, you can stitch these together, similar to how we you know, build software today with open source libraries, without having to worry that the contracts will go down someday, either because of you know, something like Twitter, where you lose your API key, or the terms of service changes. So this is what led to this explosion of innovation in this space. So this is what the Ethereum space looks like now. Um, none of this probably means much, but the basic idea is each smart contract gets built on top of others, and it creates more and more, more, and more advanced um, products based on these existing building blocks. And so at the bottom, we have Maker, which is a stable coin, and this is a very important primitive for building block for building other kinds of financial services like lending, like trading, um, margin trading, and so on. And so the final um, use case and application that, I, that is very, very ambitious is something called a decentralized autonomous organization or a DAO, right? So these are essentially a decentralized company, right? So instead of being locked to a particular jurisdiction or legal structure, you have um, token holders that act as stakeholders, and they can use these tokens to vote on proposals, decide how you know, the funds within the smart contract get spent, and so on. All right, so that's pretty much um, what I have to share today. So uh, to summarize, we have, uh, we um, talked about decentralization and why it matters. Uh, we talked about uh, smart contracts and solidity. We had a try at that as well. And we looked at several use cases of smart contracts so far. 
So uh, if you're interested to learn more, um, be sure to check out this meetup group, uh, we, Web3 Singapore. We've had a few sessions already so far, and where we go into more in depth in, in Solidity and DeFi and so on. So if you're interested, interested to learn more, do check out this uh, meetup group. Um, that's all I have to share for today. Um, thank you. If you have any questions, um, I'll be happy to answer them. All right, the first question is, can you estimate how much time is required to move your minimal, de minimal demoable viable geek coin to a minimal commercial viable one? So this depends on uh, your requirements. So for example, what kind of token do you want to build, right? Depending on that, the answer to that question, you might have to implement more features. But if we were to... Uh, um, given what we have so far, let's say that's the limit of our feature set, then deploying it to a, a main net take what? 30 minutes, that's it. Um, but the problem is, has it, okay, here's the question. How many of you invested in crypto? Oh, not many of you, all right, all right. Most of crypto projects during the uh, crypto, um, um, spring failed, right? And that has affected ap the appetite of, I guess, crypto investors. So you can't build uh, a token that is just a normal token. You have to build something that has some utility or use case. So for example, let's say uh, you build a protocol, basically a service, a lending protocol, and then your token will be a fee payment for that protocol. So that will ha be more commercially viable. And unfortunately, that involves building the protocol as well. Building the token is the easy part. But building a use case for your token, that is the hard part. All right, I think that answers the question. So, okay, here's a good question. It's an interesting question. What are the challenges of translating legal contracts into smart contracts? Right, so this is a very interesting question. So let's say, um, let's go back to the art industry, right? Let's say I tokenize a piece of art. So it's basically a row in the spreadsheet saying, you know, this art is this ID and this ID belongs to this address, right? Somebody in the real world still has to accept that as true, right? And that's where the legal side comes in. So for example, in a decentralized autonomous organization, that's not a legally, uh, that's not a legal business structure, right? So there are some projects that try to marry both the technology aspects and the legal projects. And there's something called ALAO, L-A-O, -A -A which is a legal autonomous organization, basically, where it's a, it's a decentralized organization, but it still has some legal backings to it. So it's unclear how this will work out because legal laws are enforced on a jurisdiction basis. So laws are enforced in a particular country. And so that's a central, central uh, authority. So it's, it's pretty unclear how this matches with uh, decentralized. Yeah. All, right. Thank you. all right, that's all, thanks.